What's up, college baseball fans? Welcome to another episode of the 11.7 Podcast, where we're here to break down the college baseball weekend. We'll preview the midweek. But more importantly, we got two fun, exciting activities we're going to do. We're going to show, show everybody our Field of 64 we created. We actually just did it right before the show. I worked on it last night. We perfected it today. It'll be released on a graphic later. Um, I'll also give you guys a sneak peek into my mock draft. I'll call it mock draft 0.5. It's not all the way finished, but first round's done. Might make a few changes, but we'll share our screen on the YouTube channel and um, show you guys that. Jack's going to talk about his weekend over in Houston. Dimitri will talk about his pitching performance yesterday, one inning, two strikeouts in the Italian Professional League. Uh, we'll give you all that, right? Dimitri's giving me that stone cold face right now. Hey, hey, how are we doing, guys? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're 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 late April. It's not even mid-April anymore. It is late April. Got about a, a full month left of the season. In fact, in 30 days, the SEC baseball tournament starts. Pretty fun. Lots Pretty of fun. That Tuesday, baby. Yeah, we're a month away from like those those Tuesday games in uh in Durham and in Hoover and wherever else but yeah we're, we're we're getting really close um the home field team of the week we did not even talk about so we're going to do it here on the fly um who's a team we have not done and had a good weekend Any i would suggestions, say, fellas i would say it's got to be a team like the cal it's golden like bears potentially well, no west coast bias maybe the cal golden bears Cal Golden Bears, it is coming off right. a massive sweep. Yeah, sweep. Yeah, Cal did sweep Oregon State. Oregon, State. Oregon State's been playing like trash recently, but yeah, here we go. Um, you guys are on the YouTube, but we're sharing our screen right now. We're looking at the Cal Golden Bears California collection. You knows how to party. This is really cool, but anyways. Um, whoa, whoa, that Oski yellow shirt is sick. Yeah, this one is sweet. I like this one, just a classic little. Cartoon bear leaning up against the sea. But anyways, if you use our promo code CWS24, you get 15% off your first purchase. Uh, we do this every single episode. So if you're new to the show, we're partners with Homefield Apparel. And uh, we had a meeting with them last week. They're about to launch some incredible college baseball stuff, stuff we've never seen before. And oh, uh, yeah, it's going to be really cool. So just go to homefieldapparel.com. Search for your school. As you can see here, they have over 150 schools. They're getting more every single day. So um, check it out. I mean, 15% off using our promo code. It helps us. It helps them. And uh, we have big Omaha plans with them. So that'll be fun when we get towards the uh, the postseason. We'll, we'll tell you guys our plans there. Possibly a live show. It'll be good. Anyways, you guys want to start with the uh, Field of 64? Let's just go ahead and get into it. I, I know we haven't posted our graphic yet, but... We spent a lot of time on it, and I, I want the fans to see like our thought process on everything. Can we just recap our weekend pick them, kind of a, a little talk about the weekend, and then let's do the field of 64. All right, yeah, we'll do our weekend series pick them. Um, so, Dimitri, go ahead and share your screen and pull up that graphic, because we took some risks as a group. Usually, whenever the 11.7 crew all picks the same team, you know, all three on the same team, they usually go... 0-3. Oh, we, we did it three times this weekend. We did it with Coastal beating Louisiana. We did it with um, Northeastern beating UNCW. And then we also did it with, what was the third team? Oh, Tennessee beating Kentucky. And it actually turned out pretty well for us. Uh, out of those three that we all picked the same team, uh, they went two and three. So Tennessee ended up winning the weekend and... Um, Coastal Carolina ended up winning the weekend series. As you can see here on the YouTube, we got the graphic pulled up. Coastal came through for us. Tennessee came through for us. And we owe UNCW an apology. Because UNCW, they won the weekend, and it was pretty easy. Like, I know Northeastern won Saturday's game by one run. Uh, but for the rest, like, UNCW was in charge the whole time. So props to them. They're up there tied with College of Charleston now for first place of the CAA. And uh, we do have UNCW in the field of 64. And we also we also snuck in Northeastern. So we'll show you guys that here in a second. But, Dimitri, what are your thoughts here on this uh, weekend series pick -em? Overall, really good series. Like all, think, all six of them. I think – I'll start from the top. I think the Coastal Louisiana series, I think, I think we already knew that uh, 
Coastal was really good. I think that series told me more about Louis Deanna saying, hey, they played a cupcake last couple of weeks, but I, it showed me like this team is really good. This is a good baseball team. And I think they're only. You said that they were on fraud watch. They were on fraud now? watch. There is no more fraud watch. There's no fraud warning. That is all gone. That was yesterday's news. That was last night's breaking news. Today on the Weather Channel, there's no fraud watch anymore. The raging Cajun can continue to rage. But besides, in more serious talk, I really did like Louisiana. I think they battled, they went punch for punch with arguably one of the best lineups in the country in Conway, which is even harder to do. So um, shout out to them. Florida State, Wake Forest, I think it told us a lot about both teams. Wake, they're on the rise. They're coming back. They're the preseason number one team. They're starting to look a little more like it. They're not quite there yet, but they're coming back. Florida State, on the other hand, two weekend starters out, still almost won the series. They had the lead in the rubber match and almost won it. I think that tells me a lot about Florida State. They can hang with anybody in the country. Um, I think they're going to be a really dangerous team once they're fully healthy healthy in a couple of weeks. I mean, I think that series was a, I think that was a more of like a juggernaut type series, but super underrated. Tennessee, Kentucky, same shit. Both teams really good. Went punch for punch all weekend until the final three innings on, on the rubber match. Um, NC State, I mean, I think they're a super underrated team that could end up playing their way into hosting, which we talked about when doing our thing. They have some work to do, but I mean, all of these series were really good. I mean, UNC Wilmington went Grand Slam after Grand Slam after Grand Slam. So, um, yeah, that's all I've got for these series. TCU, Texas, TCU showed they stink. Texas shows they're staying alive. They're keeping their head above water, staying afloat. Yeah. Uh, let me add on a few of these series. So, like, just starting with the TCU-Texas series, uh, I think TCU only scored one run the last two games combined. And I don't, I don't know if we're going to give – like, this Texas pitching staff is weird, right? Like, they went – I'm pretty sure they shut out San Diego all three games earlier in the season. And then no. they go up and get – no, was San, San Diego, Diego was like opening or second weekend. In oh, San Cal Poly, Diego. possibly. Yeah, I Cal think it was Poly Cal Poly. Like, second weekend, the yeah. pitching staff looked amazing, and then like another weekend, they're they're giving up 15 runs a game. So like Texas, to me, like right now their RPI sitting in like the 70s, but they're still in the hunt for a Big 12 Big 12 championship. They took care of business this weekend. TCU, like that, pretty much put the nail in the coffin for their postseason chances. I know their RPI is okay, but what are they eight and 13 in big 12 play? Like they really needed this weekend series win on the road um, against a struggling Texas team. And uh, I think you can kiss your chances. Goodbye at TCU, unless you make a huge run in the uh, big 12 tournament. But yeah, I, th I think it showed a lot about Texas. Like they, they have more than one way to beat you. Sometimes it's the pitching staff. Sometimes it's the offense. They've yet to like put it together uh, in the same weekend. So Sleeper dangerous team in Texas, in my opinion. But I'll let I Jack think, talk. I think I figured out Texas. I, I said it going into that weekend that TCU is kind of a one horse pony. Like Peyton Tolley went and won that game on Friday night, right? But yeah. because college baseball is such a like wishy washy, the world's upside down. Texas fans are like, oh man, we're we're brutal. And then all of a sudden, TCU starting to feel well. If you haven't watched TCU all year, Peyton Tolley's done that all year. Like he's dominated on Friday nights when they've won. It's but because he goes seven eight innings of scoreless baseball and they hand it off to their back end. Whereas Texas, they showed their hand a little bit earlier this week, getting beat by Rio Grande, where like they've got good arms, but their differential, their margin between their studs and their back, it, it, it's not very good afterwards. But like on Sunday, they hold TCU to a run because LBJ, LeBaron, bon LeBaron Johnson is like, he's a dude. And when he's really good, he's really good off of like, a, it's a really nice slider um, and uh, two seam mix. It's like a heavy sink or whatever you want to call it. And then they hand it off to Gage Bain, who goes and gets a three and a third inning save. They call him the big show in Austin. And it's like when they can just like go two dudes, they're really good because their offenses at times like carried them the way. Like Jalen Flores is a top five shortstop in baseball. So that was a big weekend set for them. But I still am worried about the depth in their pitching because I think they're four or five best guys. When you get to Omaha, if they can just ride those guys, then they can go beat anybody in the country. Yeah. That, yeah, that's a really good way to put it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Texas, look, they still have the – like, they have a lot out in front of them, right, with the a lot of winnable games coming up. Plus, like, games, if you win, you, like, will move up in the standings with, like, Oklahoma State and things like that. So, 
I'm not out on Texas yet. Like the, I think we said it last episode. The winner of this series, I'll, I'll take seriously. And if TCU would have won the series, I'd be like, okay, they're back, whatever. Good road win. Um, and I said that the loser of the series is pretty much going to be out of the postseason picture. So um, keep an eye out for the Texas Longhorns. Now, the series right above it here. The, the North Carolina-NC State game, like that was a Thursday, Friday, Saturday series. And, dude, it was so much fun to watch. Walk off Thursday I, night, right? Yeah, walk mm-hmm. off Thursday night. Um, and, dude, that, that was a back-and-forth game. I mean, we saw like Vance Honeycutt hit two homers. The ball was flying in Raleigh. Both teams, uh, Anthony D'Onofrio was a wizard out there in right field, making plays with his with his legs, with his arm, with his glove. And like when NC State won that game Thursday night, I, it, it first of all, it reminded me what a roller coaster this team can be. Um, when NC State throws strikes and like their bullpen does not get shelled, they're a really, really good team. Um, the offense is there. Alec Makarevich is – you know, one of the best power hitters in the country. But there was, like, pieces towards the bottom of the order. Um, Chance Nixon, uh, Trot Nixon's son, uh, played a big part on that Thursday night win. So, like, NC State, to me, we'll, we'll talk about it more here when we do the field of 64. They're one of those, like, variant teams. Like, are they going to be a last four in? Or are they going to be a regional host? Or are they just going to be a two seed? Like, there's a lot of different ways this NC State team can go. But huge series win at home. Um, against North Carolina, who, like right now, we have North Carolina projected to be a national seed. So that's going to hold a lot of weight. Um, the uh, I, I mean, that's pretty much all I had for this series. Like, it was just fun to watch. It was entertaining. It was very similar to the Tennessee-Kentucky series where both teams were just trading blow after blow. Ben, you were spot on. I, this is a coaching staff who in years past, like, they've let starters maybe go a little bit too deep into games, and that's where it's burned them. If they can trust their bullpen like in a way where they can go to it in the sixth, seventh inning. And they found that guy in Jacob Duden, who's a big, big lumberjack of a righty, about 6'5", 225, and he's just thick as hell with like three Cs. But I, when they can trust that bullpen and turn it over earlier, where like the opposing offenses don't see that start of that third or fourth time through, um, they're really good. And, and and Eli Serrano, who hit the walk-off on Thursday, that's a second walk-off in a huge – down the road rivalry game. So was really impressed with them um, because you're right. Like they go and lose series is that they shouldn't, you know, even consider to be in like, they're just so much more talented. Um, and then they go and beat teams when you're like, ah, they're done. I'm not worried about the pack. So that was pretty on brand for them. Yep. Yep. Um, where'd that graphic go? Pull that thing back up. Oops. I'm just trying to stay organized. I, I just want to see, I want to go in order from the bottom up. Um, well, Actually, I kind of want to end on this Tennessee-Kentucky series, so we'll save that one last. But UNCW, Northeastern, I'll be honest, I was just watching clips on Twitter. Um, I did not renew my Flow Sports subscription, and I probably should have. Like, this series... What are you has, talking I mean, about? Has, I have one. I keep paying damn $30 a month for this. Oh, you have thing. one? I've had it all year. I gave it to oh, you. Oh, I had one for a month, and then I canceled it. Shit, no, I gave bad. it to you at the beginning of the year. My bad. I know. Whoops. Well, I should have watched this series. Um, but listen, like UNCW just keeps doing it, right? Like they were under, they were overlooked all of last season and they ended up winning the regular season. And then when it got into the conference tournament that Jack was broadcasting, I, I went to it. Um, you know, everybody was talking about like everybody but UNC Wil- Wilmington winning it. They were like, ah, they're not offensive enough. Like they're going to have to, like, blah, 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 blah. Well, they win the tournament as well. And this is like another season where, like, going into the year, nobody was talking about UNCW. Everybody was talking about Campbell, Northeastern, um, uh, Charleston, William and Mary, Elon. Like, there was there was very few people talking about this UNCW team. And dude, they have a sophomore first baseman, Tanner Thatch, that has hit over twenty homers this year. He was a guy last year as a freshman that was like their key offensive piece. And I thought he would probably get like an Ethan Petrie kind of. Um, look this year like a soft not a sophomore slump but just pitched around like let's let somebody else beat him and teams have pitched around him but he still makes him pay um so like this uncw team they're in the 20s in the rpi um they have a really good resume and they just continue to win series and and they're tied for first place right now with with college of charleston in the uh, caa standings even though i guess charleston has the tiebreaker but just another team that consistently wins. It's hard to beat this team twice. That's what I have written down in my notes. Hard to beat UNCW twice. So another team in the postseason, when they get there, like 
they could surprise and win a regional as a two seed or a three seed. I'll keep it simplistic on these dudes. When we made this pick, I was like, man, I'm damned if you do, damned if you don't. We've got a whole lot of pencil talk ambassadors in both camps. I just figured that the home team on that red turf was going to be able to walk away with it. But uh, my boys at Seahawk Perch, we're going to shout out the main man, Luke Craig, who ended up closing out game three. UNCW, they just run this shit. He, he was screaming it for pretty much everyone in the Boston Commonwealth area to hear him say it. The only thing I'm going to say about this series is the CAA deserves to get three teams in the tournament this year. I've been saying it all year. I'll say it again. It's just really good baseball. Uh, and, and if you get to watch a whole series, you'll realize like that they play all three phases of the game at a really elite level. Yeah, well said. Dimitri, you have any thoughts on this? I already gave you guys all my thoughts on all of them. I thought that's what we were doing. Oh, well, <laughs> I wanted to take a little bit more time. We're only 15 minutes in. We can wrap up these last three series in two minutes. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, so Louisiana versus or at Coastal, um, I think we all kind of saw it coming. Like Coastal just plays so much better at home than on the road. Uh, I think it could have been a different story if this was in Lafayette and uh, – and at the Teague, there was just moments where Coastal's offense was able to put up crooked numbers, uh, whether it's doubles off the wall, homers, whatever. And uh, the offense was just a little bit too much. Now, what I want to say about both of these teams, like Louisiana still has a four-game lead in uh, the Sun Belt over Coastal, uh, which is a pretty big margin. Louisiana has got a tough schedule down the road, and uh, Coastal has a little, little bit lighter. But anyways, my point is, like Louisiana is just going to be a pain for anybody that they face in the postseason, whether they're a two seed or a three seed, it doesn't matter. Uh, like these guys don't go away. Even whenever you thought coastal Carolina was going to run away with the game, Louisiana would battle back and make it a ball game, make it close. They ended up coming back and winning that Saturday game. So um, I think this, this series says exactly what we were expecting um, a scrappy Louisiana team, but coastal's offense at home was just a little bit too much. Same thing with Florida State at Wake Forest. Florida State, we saw them on the road at Clemson, what was it, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and they weren't able to, well, first of all, they weren't able to trust their bullpen. Plus, they were going into the series down a couple arms. So I, I honestly should have probably taken Wake Forest here. Um, I still thought Florida State top to bottom was a better team, but I'll tell you this, like Wake Forest, scary as hell. Like they have, they have all their pieces back. They're figuring out the pitching staff, pitching rotation. Uh, guys are finding their role. And I know they were preseason unanimous number one team in the nation, and then they kind of fell off a cliff. Like they're going to be a national seed, I think. I, I think they're going to end up being a top eight national seed, hosting a regional. And God, their offense is so scary at home. It is, it is crazy. So Wake Forest, if you can, if you're a college baseball investor and you want to throw a team, like throw some money on a team to win the College World Series. Now are the best odds you're going to get on Wake Forest because I think they're going to keep going down. Um, do you guys have any thoughts there on the uh, on that series? I just forgot to mention Florida State bullpen might keep them for, out of Omaha. Yeah, it's. I mean, everything when they're on the road, that bullpen on the road has been really bad, really, yeah. really bad. This team is too good. Like I feel bad for Link Jared. I feel bad for a lot of those older guys on this team in that offense. They're going to be held pedestrian by that bullpen. I mean, they had, I think they had the lead in all three games, or at least two of them. I mean, yesterday they had a 5 1 lead through four or five innings, and Wade kept chipping back. And next thing you know, it, it was a two run homer late, and it was over. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just disappointed with Florida State's bullpen. I mean, Notre, thinking of Link Jarrett team, Notre Dame bullpen was unbelievable in their college world series run they went through knoxville with that bullpen starting pitching in bullpen and it's just disappointing to see the florida state team the link jarrett team have an awful bullpen so yeah, other dude, than that even, I think even florida when link jarrett was coaching at unc greensboro like when we were playing in the socon i mean he had a major leaguer in his bullpen andrew wance who's pitching for the angels like at a mid-major school like and he had two or three other guys that were just like these big workhorses that would eat up two three innings out of the bullpen um you're right. I mean, he's always had dudes out of the back end of the bullpen that he just doesn't really have right now to trust. Could you imagine? Could you imagine Wyatt Crowell in this bullpen this year or on this Not team really. this year? I mean, they would be they would be significantly better. 
I mean, that would be their, that would be their, what's the guy's name from Coastal, the reliever, what's his name, that from a couple, when they won the national title? Uh, Beckwith. Beckwith? That would be their Beckwith this year. That would yeah. be their guy to get him in the seventh inning, it's over, ball game's over, they win. Like, yeah. That's like that's what they're missing. They're just missing that X factor in the bullpen. But yeah, besides all that. All right. Any closing thoughts on Wake Forest, Florida State? Jack, you got anything before we move on to probably the best series that we'll see all year? Let's get to them. We good. All right, dude. Tennessee at Kentucky was incredible. Um, the only complaint that the the broadcasters were not good. Um, not really into the game. Very monotone. Very like there would be huge moments, and I'm freaking out, jumping up uh, on the couch, like. Holy shit, like oh my, Christian Moore again. And they're like, and Christian Moore hits a fly ball to right field. And uh, yep, this one's going to carry over. Home run, his third of the day. It's like, what the hell, man? Like, come on. <laughs> like, get something behind it. You're, you're broadcasting a top five overall series. But anyways, that's besides the point. The, look, for me, Kentucky showed me a lot. Like, Kentucky, Kentucky's always been overlooked in the SEC. Um it's crazy to say, I know they hosted a regional last year and like, I know that they're, you know, top five overall this year, but like, that's a team that's built different than a lot of other teams. And I think this is going to make sense in just a second. Just follow along with me. It's going to come full circle. This series kind of got down in the mud, right? Like it was scrappy. Both teams were, were, you know, fired up at certain points. Like the, the, the crowd was into it. Like Kentucky though, can get teams into the mud and make them fold. Um, when when a team is probably not mentally strong enough or like whatever, uh, like K- Kentucky can go in anywhere and win a series. Doesn't matter if it's at home or on the road. Tennessee kind of likes the chippiness though, and they played into it well. And and the big the big time players at Tennessee showed up it, between you know Blake Burke and Christian Moore. Uh, Billy Amick had a big hit. Like there was like this is the type of environment that Tennessee thrives in. And anyways, what it shows me, Kentucky, legitimate Omaha contender. Um, and I think that, I think Kentucky, if they get to Omaha, their style of play will play fabulous at Charles Schwab Field. And they're hitting balls in the gap. They're, I mean, there was no easy at bats for this Tennessee pitching staff. Um, but at the end of the day, like Tennessee proved to me, not only are they a top five team, like they're up there with AM for like most dangerous, lethal, put a crooked number up on you, any inning, every inning uh, type of team. So overall, and it was, it was incredible to watch really, really fun series. I agree. I think, I think that series showed me similar with Louisiana. It showed me, Hey, this Kentucky team, no, I don't care who you are. 14, one in the SEC is unbelievable, but Mm -hmm. I think 14, one in the SEC again, the bad team is a little different than being the number one team in the SEC. Just like you know what I mean, I I need to see it. I need to see you against yeah. the top three teams in the SEC for, for real for me to stamp it and be like this team is a damn good team. But they showed yeah. it. They didn't win the series, but they showed they damn sure as hell showed they belong in the top five. They yeah. belong. What's crazy is Tennessee could have swept. Like, there was one bad inning Tennessee had that. Uh, let's see that Friday night. What day did they win? Friday. It wasn't Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The first game. Kentucky took advantage of a couple of Tennessee mistakes. Um, but other than that, like Tennessee played really, really well. And it just goes to show you how hard it is to week, win week in and week out in the SEC. I mean, Kentucky used to be an afterthought. That's just another team that teams have to worry about in the SEC now. Like what Nick and Jones has built there is impressive. And, they're, and it's like they have a style. They have a style that is the Kentucky way. Right. Yeah. I've got two quick points on each team that stood out to me big time this weekend. And Ben, I, I've, I'm so glad you brought up the broadcasters because I feel like the way that they broadcasted this weekend is really on point with how people are talking about both of these teams, which is wildly underwhelming to the level mm-hmm. of play that you see. And you're like, how could you possibly like two years ago, Tennessee was the bad boys of all of baseball, professional baseball included. They were the talk of the town and this might be Vitello's best team. And we're still like, Oh cool. Like it's Tennessee. Ever, there's still much larger and louder conversations being had. The two things that stood out to me though, um, Kentucky's jerseys to me 
are not Kentucky. Like for some reason, I feel like I'm not watching Kentucky baseball. I, I, I still haven't figured out the new logo. I, that's my first dumb thought. Second, Ryan Waldschmidt's going to play professional baseball for a super long time. Like every at bat yep. is big league as hell. Every, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to see him in Charleston. Like the walks to strikeout ratio is insane if you go look at it his entire career. For Tennessee, I think that this team plays for a national championship this year in Omaha. They've got four or five guys that have made starts for them this year. The strikeouts walk ratio on the mound is really impressive. They pitch to contact. They get outs in big time leverage moments. Like, and they just like it doesn't matter who they're bringing in out of the pen. Everyone feels like they get it done after six quality innings on the mound every single time. The second thing about Tennessee baseball, I saw him and I met him earlier this year. And I'm not forgetting anybody. I think Christian Moore is the best second baseman in the country. And I think he plays professional baseball for a really long time. I know, like, the timing of it after his three home runs on, like, sat Sunday is obviously, oh, like, it's, you know, recency bias. But the way that he defends that position as well, where he's played some shortstop before, they slide him over to second. I bet if you played him at third, he'd be just fine. So he can be a career utility guy where you see Trey Lipscomb at, you know, with the Nationals right now. Like, he could follow that mold. But I think he's 10x that. Like, I think he's – the best second baseman in the country. I'm not forgetting anybody on the West Coast. I want to emphasize that yet again. Um, man, Tennessee's fun. That's all I got. Yeah, bold take there. There's going to be a lot of people angry about the best yeah, second baseman in the country with Travis Bazana. Listen, um, let's let's talk about Christian Moore just briefly. What he's doing in SEC play is incredible. And, and so Perfect. I want to bring this point up. When, when teams are voting on – SEC player of the year, first team all SEC, second team all SEC. At least to my knowledge, the way they used to do it, and I think they still do it, is SEC games only. So it doesn't matter what you did non-conference. It doesn't matter what you do on the midweeks. And I'm telling you this right now, if that's the case, I think Christian Moore might win SEC player of the year. And it's going to – people are going to go nuts because they're going to be like, Charlie Condon and Jack Caglione, this and that. The numbers that Christian Moore is putting up in, in conference play are, are crazy. I don't have them in front of me, but all I know is every weekend that kid hits two or three homers. <laughs> wait, insane. wait. Do you actually believe what you're saying right now? Yes. Yeah. Do you actually believe Charlie Condon or Jack Cagliano are not going to win it? Do you honestly not, believe? No, no, wait, no, I, no, 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 no. You're, you're trying to get me in trouble. I did not say it. I'm just saying that there's a chance that Christian Moore could win it. And it's going to throw – like nobody's going to see it happening. But when you when the coaches have the stats in front of them and they're like, all right, who had the best SEC season? Let me ask you I, this question then. Hold on, Jack. Let me ask you this question then. Do you think there's a chance that Jack Canyonon or Charlie Condon don't win it? No. Well, wait, no. Well, there you wait, go. Then how does Christian Moore have a chance? I'll tell question? you. I, I think you changed your question on me. I didn't. I said, is there a chance that Jack Cagnon or Charlie Condon do not win SEC Player of the Year? And he said, no. I did not change anything. I'm looking up the SEC stats right here. I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now. I, Christian Moore's got 19 home runs on the year. 13 of them are in SEC play. 13 of them are in SEC play. Like, he, he slug OPS good, over one. Good for Christian Moore. Congratulations, yeah. Christian Moore. Well, I'm just, I'm with Ben. Like, whereas if you were to see his name, like maybe jump one of those two guys and finish second in those, like, rank, like, I'm just, what he's doing is really stupid. Hold on. I'm getting SEC stats only. Hand Hold up. up. I'll All share same. my screen. Because I think this is a good conversation to have. Like, let's talk about SEC zero. Player of the Year. Because listen, like Braden Montgomery's up there in my opinion too, and like Jace Laviolette is up there too. Like, there's just so many. Hagen Smith is another guy. So, like, votes are going to be spread around. Like, it's not a unanimous pick in by any means. As of right now, it could be, eventually. But the only way. All right, here I got it pulled up. I got it pulled up. Let me share my screen. Let's see. The only way Condon or Cags don't win it is that they punish them for being on bad team. All right, here we go. SEC games only. You guys can see this, right? Charlie Condon, yeah. Charlie Condon, Charlie Condon. That's that's all I need to see. Christian Moore hits first. 32. Christian Moore tied for first in RBIs. Go to homers. 
Christian Moore leading in homers. Oops, my bad. I, dude, I'm, that's what I'm trying to say, Dimitri, is like, and like total bases. Look, he's got the most total bases in SEC play. I'm just saying, like, there's a conversation to be had for SEC player of the year. Now, listen, Condon, Caglione, they could win golden spikes. They've had a better overall season. But, but it, yeah. 13 of his 19 in the SEC. Like, it's really dumb. Like, and, and for whatever reason, he's the perfect representation of this Vols team where, like, years past, they've gotten a ton of love, and rightfully so. Like, when you look at that 21 and 22 team. And then last year, he takes maybe arguably his most underwhelming team to Omaha. And then this year, no one's really talking about him. You don't know the stars like you did in years past. And you're like, wait, they've got maybe the best player in the conference, question mark? Yeah, here, here's another here's another point. Christian Moore could potentially win the SEC triple crown. Batting average, he's 20 points off. Uh, RBIs, he's tied for first. Home runs, he's in first. So it's like the, people need to start putting respect on Christian Moore's name in like the season he's having because conference players' years, conference stats only. And look, I don't know if the voters are going to do it like that. They might say, look, Condon and Caglione are having some of the best seasons we've ever seen. But I'm just saying, don't sleep third, on it. Let me say it for the third time, make it very clear. The best second baseman in the country, Christian Moore. Just I, I know who I'm I best second baseman in the country. That's still a bold take. Oh man, we're, someone's gonna clip this, but whatever. Best. <laughs> you know what? All right, wait, you know Jack. What? All right, Jack. So I'm you're saying like right if now. you draft a team, your leadoff hitter, second baseman, you're taking Christian Moore over Travis Bazana. In a college Hold baseball on. season. Not for like I'm not a professional baseball team. I'm not like I, it's, I'm, I'm talking if I got to build a college baseball team, I'll take Christian Moore at second base and I'll hit him in the two six hole. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Hold the damn phone. Holding the phone right now. What do you got for All right, us? Here we go. Here we go. Saying? Second baseman, Travis Bazana, 434. All right. 434. I got, hey, I, I know his numbers. I know his numbers. I I, I was 19 homers, and he's slugging his OPS is fifteen sixty one, buddy. Christian Moore's is twelve hundred, and he plays in the SEC. Christian Moore's seventy points lower in batting average, and his OPS is three hundred points lower. I'm not saying Christian Moore is bad. Time out. I'm not saying but, Christian Moore is well, bad. No, I, I think know we're, we're ranking. I know I I'm well aware. I, I knew it was going to be a hot take. I'm just saying to do it in the SEC versus the doo doo head ass Pac-12 is my difference for that. It's not a hot uh, take. It's a great take. It's just wrong. Okay. It's a great take. It's just wrong. Look, I, I think at the end of the day, whether it's right, or there is no right or wrong answer. I think there's going to be people with like different opinions and everything, but we're having a conversation about it, right? Like we're actually talking about like. Who, who is maybe the best SEC player this year? Who is the best second baseman in the country? Where, and I, like, I'm perfectly okay having these conversations because the college baseball like landscape, and I've harped on this a bunch, the college baseball landscape is so lame. It, people get these opinions in their head that they see back in like January or February and they hold on to it. Um, or like they'll see one player getting a ton of coverage and the other player not. And like they hold on to these opinions and say, you're wrong. Like, you're wrong. Like, blah, 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 blah. It's like, where are you getting your opinions from? Like, oh, you get them from a different site. Or, like, you get them from, you know, wherever. You watched one game, and you're like, oh, he went off. There needs to be more takes, more opinions, more uh, whatever you want to call it. Like, there needs to be more conversations about players across the country. Because it's such a national landscape of everybody holds the same opinions, and it's so dumb. Like, let's have a conversation. Like, you would have got laughed off, like laughed at if you didn't have LSU in Florida hosting a regional preseason. You would have got laughed at. It's like, well, they're they're not going to be as good. Like, what makes you think that they're guaranteed to host? And it's like, but and you now, know what else is annoying? None of those people will circle back and say, "Hey, you were right. I was wrong." Nobody yeah. does. They're all burner I, accounts that that'll just attack you. No shit. I think this podcast, we do better than anyone in the country in any sport of doing, hey, we are big hand up, guys. I fuck, I fuck, uh, we're the Speaking best at it. Speaking of hand up. Yeah. Cincinnati Bearcats. 
congratulations. <laughs> you have beaten my made up fake win total of four and a half. You have you know, three and a half. You have shattered it. You are 99 in the Big 12. Congratulations. We, we need to apologize to Cincinnati, Baylor, and Missouri because they yeah. all three had, like, we, we had their conference win totals at like four and a half each. And they're all at like nine. Well, maybe not Missouri, but still. Missouri, um, eight. They're six and twelve. I mean, they're already they're already ahead of schedule. We clowned Missouri. We said that they wouldn't win a series. Like we we put their win total at four and a half. We clowned them. We were wrong. Um, How the fuck? Oh, also, you- one more thing. I want to make this very clear. Time out. One more thing. Earlier this season, I talked about like hating the phrase, like you don't know ball. Like when someone that. replies, you don't know ball, or you know ball. Whatever. Like, I'm just so tired of that phrase. There's one more phrase I'm so tired of. And it's when somebody comments, um, like, update question mark. Like, we'll post, uh, Kentucky will hit a go-ahead home. And it's like, you know, we'll tweet about the go-ahead home. And then Vol Nation will come back and say, like, update. Can we have an update? Like, update this. Like, dude. dude come on. I, you, you, got, you love that shit. They're, they're like, they're ready. They're I'm, I'm so update. tired of it. I would say over half of our replies this weekend were just people saying, like, update? Can we get an update? <laughs> update, please? It's like, dude, I'm so over that. Don't say it anymore. But I know it's going to cause more people to say it now that I say it. But I mean, um, hold on. You have been running the Twitter way more lately. Um, I love when I would, like, in the lab, like, running the Twitter, I love when people do update. Because I quote tweet and be like, um, yeah, update, you're still losing. <laughs> yeah. because, because they still tweet update and then the other team will hit a home run take the lead again and you'll be like are you sure you want that update yeah I didn't, I didn't play into it very well but I mean yeah, I, I so came out and said like Ryan Waldschmidt deserves SEC player of the, game, or of the week and then Christian Moore proceeds and hits three homers in the next hour and a half and then they're all asking for an update I was like listen at the time Ryan Waldschmidt was the SEC player of the week. He has like five homers this week. He's made diving catches, outfield assists. Like he's been balling out. He's been on base every single time. But like, I'm sorry, Christian Moore hits three homers in 90 minutes. Like, don't ask for an update. You got your update. (laughs) I can feel the frustration mostly because I think this weekend of college baseball was the most update driven weekend we've had in a long time. Like, I was in the great state of Houston, Texas with a ton of AM fans. That AM Alabama series, I feel like switch scores like maybe every 15 minutes, every half inning, someone was hitting home or retake the lead. That Virginia yeah. Tech game series fucking rocked. Like that was update, update. update. like just <laughs> homers back and forth either way. Like, yeah, you probably were feeling the heat from everybody. Yeah. It was coming from all different directions, man. It was it was tough. It was <laughs> it was a battleground on social media this weekend. Uh, but yeah, Texas A and M. We haven't even talked about them yet. We'll, we'll go ahead. Let's just go ahead and pull up our field of sixty four because they're the number one overall seed. Yeah. Well, we don't Dude, have they, a graphic they're crazy. For you yet. We don't huh? have a graphic for you yet. We can just pull up the Excel sheet. It's fun. All right. People can see the raw data we were looking behind. Um, but yeah, that Texas A and M Arkansas or not Arkansas Texas A and M Alabama series. It looked so good for Alabama at first. It really did when they jumped out to a five nothing lead, like the fifth inning. I'm like, dude, Alabama's going to do it. They're going to knock off number one teams in back-to-back weeks. And, I mean, a and scored a touchdown in, like, two minutes. It was like, comparing it to college football, a team goes down and scores. Uh, they run the ball six times. They have a play-action pass. They they punch it in on the one-yard line on fourth and goal. Like, that's what Alabama was doing. And then AM just threw an 85-yard bomb for a touchdown. Boom, they take the lead. <laughs> Dang, dude, right, Alabama on. grinded for those five runs, and and it made it look like it was nothing. Brady Montgomery and, and hits they, two homers, one from each side of the plate. Like it was just crazy how fast they scored. And the couple times they do it with two outs, too, or like how deflating was it for for Bama, where you're like, we just we just needed one more. Like for the love of God, another crooked number. Bama's like drawing walks on three two counts, eleven pitch at bats, and then bunting them over, and then hitting a single to score a run, and. Then a and gets, you know, two doubles off the wall and then back-to-back homers. It's like, oh, you're losing 6-5 now. For the love of but God. But here it is. Stop. Here's our field of 64. Uh, orange means automatic qualifier. And uh, blue means at-large. Um, white just means you're hosting at-large, whatever you want to call it. But um, we, we definitely highly recommend everybody watching the YouTube on this on this episode. 
our podcast numbers are really good and our YouTube numbers are getting better, but um, we're trying to do more visual stuff here. So subscribe to our YouTube. I think we're at like a little over 600, which is crazy. Like you guys are the best for supporting it. We started it this year and um, yeah, it, it's growing really good. I don't really know what YouTube numbers and subscribers mean. Every YouTube channel I watch, like, like and subscribe, like and subscribe. I don't think it really matters. Like whether you get this podcast form or YouTube or whatever, I'm just kind of addicted to growth. Like I want to see growth and everything. So um, if you're not subscribed to the YouTube, go ahead and do it. But here we are. We got our field of 64. Texas A&M, number one overall seed. Other than that time they slipped up on the road against Florida, I mean, they've had just awesome pitching, even better hitting. Offense is led by two All-Americans, like plus probably freshman of the freshman of the year nationally, yeah. Graham Grahovic. So Coach Lawson has got the boys rolling. We think they're going to win the rest of their SEC series. That was an easy pick. Um, pretty much two through about ten. Two seed through ten seed was mix and match. We have it as Clemson, the two overall seed, Arkansas three, Tennessee four, North Carolina five, Kentucky six, Wake Forest seven, Florida State eight, East Carolina nine, Duke ten. That gave us a lot of trouble. Like, not trouble. It's just like, dude, flip a coin. Like, also, I could see any of these teams being the two overall seed. If they just finish strong, like I can see any of these teams being the 10 overall seed, but I'm pretty confident that all eight of them are going to host or all nine of them, whatever you want to call it. And then uh, the last six remaining hosts, Indiana State, we have at 11. Their RPI is really good. Soft schedule. They should carry it. Um, Coastal Carolina, 12. I know they're not leading the Sun Belt. We think they're going to win the Sun Belt tournament, probably win the rest of their weekend series. So, Their RPI is good enough. They're going to probably host over there in in Conway. Virginia 13. They were just kind of the next best ACC team. Pretty light schedule moving forward. So, like, they could bump their way up. I don't really know. Oregon State 14. Let me me stop there. 14, 15, and 16 was tough. Like, that was one of the toughest parts about building this. We have Oregon State 14, South Carolina 15, Oklahoma State 16. I think we could say the winner of the Pac-12 will get that 14 seed, whether it's Arizona or Oregon State, maybe Oregon too. Like they're still alive. Um, we need a West Coast. We need a West Coast host, not because of like equality or anything, but just so we can get that 10 p.m. first pitch. Somebody tweeted it, that that at us earlier, uh, like two days ago, and I agree 100. percent Like we need that 10 or 11 p.m. first pitch on that Friday of regional play. It it just makes it that much better. Um, And then for 15 overall seed, like we think there's going to be one more SEC team, whether it's South Carolina, Georgia, Vanderbilt, Alabama could play their way in. Like one of those is going to probably host. So we gave it to South Carolina, just what they've done so far and like the schedule they have remaining, like they should be able to take care of business. And then the 16 seed, we have Oklahoma State. And that came down between like Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, possibly Texas. Like whoever runs away with the Big Twelve, um, I think could find themselves in this position to host. So yep. don't don't get mad at us if your team's not hosting. Like there's still four weekends left plus conference tournaments. Like it's up for the grabs. This is just how we're projecting it. Um, this could look like crash to you. Okay, sorry. Like. Let's look at your field of 64. I'm sure we can find some things that are crashed about that. Um, but we just kind of agreed that this, we like closed our eyes and thought about it. And we're like, can we see this team hosting? Okay, yeah, let's throw them in. So um, those are the 16 hosts there. Um, well, you guys want to add anything? I'll let you talk now. I've been talking a lot. I was just going to go through it. I mean, I was just going to kind of follow up on you. a and M. Win streaks of 17, 8, and 7 this year. Really impressive. Like, that's by far the best team. But I think whoever finishes first in the SEC will get the number one spot. It could be Arkansas. It could be maybe yeah. even be Tennessee. Um, I think Clemson is kind of, as of right now, in what they've done going forward, I think Clemson will end up being kind of locked in at that two spot. It doesn't really matter too much. I mean, if you're if you're top four, it doesn't really matter. Um 
North Carolina. I mean, they they're putting together they're quietly putting together a really good year. I mean, I, I think they've lost a couple spotlight series, but overall, they're putting a good series. Kentucky, you could make an argument that Kentucky should be higher. You could make an argument for that. Yeah. Um, what? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Wake Forest, Florida State, right there. I think they, Florida State could end up being a twelve. I think Wake Forest could easily end up being a twelve. We're kind of projecting the rest of the, the rest of the way here. I think Wake Forest heats up and propelled themselves into a national seed conversation. Florida State, stay alive at this point. You've done enough. Just stay alive at this point, and you'll be just fine in the national seed. Um, East Carolina could easily be a national seed. I think their schedule is really weak. I think you kind of talked about that. And then that the East Carolina um, series win. That East Carolina series win against North Carolina. I'm I'm interested to see what the committee says about that because, like, they do have the head to head. I don't think they're going to put East Carolina in like that top five or six picture. Like, if they do get a, a national seed, it'll be like seven or eight. But I don't know, man. East Carolina, they're playing really good baseball. I got three of the best pitchers in the country too. So, um, yeah, and the offense is looking good. Head to head doesn't really matter unless it comes down to two teams in the same conference or something like that. Like if we were looking at Arkansas and Tennessee, if for example Tennessee beat Arkansas in a series, we would put Tennessee. The committee would put them in front of them. But head to head well, doesn't I, really matter. The full one fifty, a hundred or fifty six game full resume. Well, I think what you're trying to say is what I, I kind of looked at, and I think is going to be the big one is. That last series of the year between Duke and North Carolina, to me, is going to decide who gets the national seed. Like, yeah. like when you look at, at, at well Durham, in Durham, Duke, North Carolina, whoever wins that series is going to is going to host like nationally. The other is going to surely host a regional as well. Um, the the way that Duke is swinging the bats right now, plus how many arms they have that are bullpen, to me, if they go win the ACC tournament over Clemson. That kind of eradicates that early season win for Clemson over them. And I could even see Duke jumping Clemson at that stage of the game. I know they've been great, but um, but yeah, but to your point, that those in conference ones, especially late in the year, a little recency bonds, that North Carolina Duke one will to me take up a Nashville spot for sure. Yeah. Um, Ben, you were fighting hard for Alabama to be a host. It's just hard to see them digging out of a 7-11 SEC record right now. Could they do it? Yes. Their schedule is there for them to do it. And I yeah. think do you want to, let's talk about that real quick. I mean, so they're seven and eleven SEC, but they do have a series win against Tennessee and they have a series win against Arkansas. Um, their last four series are like Mississippi State, Ole Miss, LSU, and Auburn. Like if they run the table, they'll be considered like a hot team, um, someone that can play their way in. Like Alabama hosting is not crazy to think about. But let's just say they go two out of three every weekend. They finish eight and four. They'll be 15 and 15 to finish the SEC season. Go to Hoover, you get two wins. And then you could be 17 and 17 SEC wins, 500 overall in the SEC. Yeah. Maybe. It's just, it's just they, they, they have to really play well here on out. They need to sweep and win every series, and they'll be in the hosting picture. But it's just hard to project that right now with South Carolina, what, two or three games in front of them? Right, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's why – that's kind of where South Carolina comes in. And their schedule you could consider somewhat favorable. They've got, like, one or two hard, hard series left. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, Oregon State, terrible the last two weeks. But overall, you can't forget the narrative around them. They were considered the, no doubt about it, best team in the country at one point with Arkansas, 1A, 1B. That's what everybody was saying. They were that good. They do look that good, and I think they can be that good again. So if they play well the rest of the year, I think they'll be that West Coast team. I don't think the West Coast will have zero host. There's no way. Yeah, I, you talked me out of it. I really wanted to put Arizona there. Just They're playing really good baseball. They're red hot. Um, they're in first place in the Pac-12. But, yeah, when you when you kind of talked me through it, I was like, you know, you're right. Like, we were talking about Oregon State being the, like one of the best teams in the country for the first six weeks. So – um, if they figure it out and finish strong, it's just tough when they've lost four straight Pac-12 games. They've lost five out of the last six games. Mm-hmm. Like they're they're playing bad baseball right now. Yo, their last four losses are com- by a combined five runs. They're playing bad and they're still barely losing. Like that's what yeah. that gives me hope that Oregon State will be just fine. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but yeah, but anyways, as you can see, like the two seeds here, 
I mean, they were kind of tough, but at the same time, like we're just projecting. Like we threw Alabama in at the Oklahoma State Regional. Um, the first, I mean, like Alabama, in my opinion, is either going to host or going to be one of the top two seeds, just with the schedule they have remaining. Uh, unless they just fold and they, they suck the rest of the year, which would suck, but whatever. Um, Oklahoma, you know, we put them as a two seed pretty high up at South Carolina. It's between them and Oklahoma State. Like, I think one of those two teams will host. UC Irvine staying out west at Oregon State, like a really just powerful two seed, um, good RPI. Probably not good enough to host, but, you know, they're, they're a tough team. West Virginia up there in the Big 12 standings. I, I don't – do we want to read off every team? I guess we have no, to because it's a no, podcast. No, but I'm not going to – that is a snooze fest to sit here and just read off every team. All right, yeah, you're right because I, I was already getting bored just reading it off. All right, so we're going to post a graphic. If you're listening to the podcast, um, you can kind of follow along with the graphic that we're going to post on Twitter here in just a second. But um, really, I mean, like the, the regionals kind of shaped out to be like pretty cool-looking regionals. Um, like, for example, like the Arkansas 3 overall regional, Arkansas, Dallas Baptist, Louisville Army – that, that feels like a regional to me. Um, Louisville sitting at nine and nine. They were one of the last four teams in, but they have a soft ACC schedule. They're going to finish around 500 in the ACC, which usually gets you in. So like that was a cool regional to build. Uh, Dallas Baptist is playing bad baseball. They've lost three straight weekend series, but like still a good team, pretty good resume. Like they would be a, a strong two seed over there in Arkansas. Hey, I was going to bring up something. If you're new to college baseball, you're new to listening to us, anything like that, don't forget conference tournament will also play a factor. So, for example, the SEC and AC, you got 30 conference games. A lot of these teams, let's say they finish 15 and 15 in conference play. They go to their conference tournament. It is still another opportunity to boost your resume before Selection Monday. So you can yeah. go in there and get three more wins, which will be counted as conference wins. And now if you're pushing 18 conference wins, 19 conference wins, you're in the hosting picture or you're in a strong two seat or whatever, or if you're a bubble team and you go there yeah. and get at two or three more wins, you are solidifying yourself as, from a bubble team to maybe a two seat, a strong two seat. Like that's how much can change in the final seven days of the regular season and conference tournament. So, that's what Ole Miss yeah. did in 2022. And they went on to win the national championship. So, yeah. um, Oh, another point that I have to bring up about conference tournament week we're seeing a lot of mid-major conferences like limit how many teams get into the tournament. So like back when we were playing every conference tournament, I feel like every team was invited, you know, one through 12 or one through 10 or whatever it was. Um, there's a lot of conferences now that are shortening it to like top four teams or top six teams. And they're doing it for RPI purposes because those are more like usually the top four or five teams in your conference are going to have a, uh, Half decent. Um, like a decent, like we're talking mid-major conferences here, but they're going to have like a decent RPI. So those are just more like quadrant two, maybe possibly quadrant one games that they get in the conference tournament. Plus they're rewarding those teams that, you know, played well all season. Um, like, don't forget. I, I know like the CAA, I think the CAA is only a top six teams. The big East only takes the top four. Um, the big West like doesn't even have a conference tournament. So like, there's just, it's it's different. It's like a different landscape than like early 2010s when every yeah. team made every conference tournament. And don't forget, quadrant one wins now at home are only top 25 teams in the RPI. On the road, it's top 60. So it is very different. Very different. The dynamic is very different in terms of how do you measure a quad a team quad one. Now you got to look at quad one and quad two. Quad two wins and losses matter way more now because. Yeah. Uh, a home home win against a team that is 30 in the RPI is considered a quad two win. So you've got to look at that. But basically what you're essentially looking at is top 100 wins. Now, quad one, quad two, put them together, top 100 wins. That is kind of how you more differentiate and rank some of these teams when looking at resumes. Yep, and to yep, 100%. To y'all's, to y'all's point, watching and listening, y'all put it together, like not a ton of love to the Pac-12 and Big 12. Like those conference tournaments are going to be like, instrumental into like seeing who's going to be able to separate themselves into like being a strong two versus maybe a back half three. Yeah. yeah. No, hundred percent. Completely out and gets in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last four teams in that we put, like, I know Florida was one of those last four teams in look, I know that they're right above 500 and like they're eight and 10 in the sec, but like what, my opinion on Florida is like they're going to do just enough to get into that tournament. Plus, they have the Caglione factor that the committee might like. 
the committee's biased to be honest yeah. with you guys like it's not like they're robots um don't forget and when the best possibly the best player we've seen in the last two years combined like they're going to try to find a way to get him in the tournament so if florida has 13 sec wins and then they win two games in in hoover like they're probably going to be in as an at-large as a three seed um yeah our other choices are horrific they're they're a bunch of stinky pinky poopy team poopy stinky team that we would have taken over Florida if we didn't put Florida in. So the bubble is disgusting right now. And the bubble is like ginormous, like this. It'll shrink to this in the next three weeks. Yeah, especially with like stolen bids too. Um, when you find a conference that's a one bid league, yep. like if somebody wins the American, like that's a stolen bid because East Carolina is like really the only team projected in. Um, and then like same thing for like the four C's here. Like if you're watching on the YouTube, you might be a fan of like SEMO or you might be a fan of Bryant or Sanford or whoever. Like these are all just like kind of placeholders, right? Because those conference tournaments, like none of these teams are getting in for an at-large team. Um, so it's pretty much like whoever's going to win the A-10 or who's going to win the SOCON or whatever. Um, we just kind of took the best team that projects the best for the regular season. But those conference tournaments get crazy. Hey, uh, like, so crazy is an understatement. Just because your team is not top four, don't lose hope. 19 and 42 lane green wave. We're in the tournament because they won their conference tournament. Never yeah. lose hope. There's always hope. Even if Except your if team is uh, stinky. Unless you're Even Maryland you're, Eastern Shore, who's 0-35 yeah. this year. They got a shot. They, they probably They're, lost they might, be, they might be a little stinky, pinky, poopy team, which, by the way, we yeah. have to put that on the shirt. We have to put that on the shirt. <laughs> hey, Ben, what else do you have on our agenda today? Um, I mean, we can preview the midweeks. I, I can show like a brief, like mock draft that I put together. Mock draft 0. 0.5. Get the people going, talk through it a little bit. Let's do that. Let's do, do that. Right right. Yeah. I mean, we're less than, uh, less than three months away from the draft. So let's go ahead and pull this thing up. I think it's on this tab. Here we go. You guys see this? Ignore like the player comps. I'm, I'm still playing around with it. And like, I haven't had write-ups or anything on anybody. But like as of right now, here's uh, here's my uh, my first round, including supplementary picks, one through thirty nine, for the MLB draft mockup. I I don't see any way that the Cleveland Guardians don't take Jack Caglione number one over him. And listen, Condon, Hagen Smith, Braden Montgomery, Bazana, Kurtz, like those guys, they all deserve number one overall talk. But when you're in the Cleveland Guardians. And you have a 6'6 guy that throws left-handed 99 miles an hour. He has hit the most homers combined the last two seasons. And he not only hits homers, but he hit a ball 514 feet the 16. other day. Um, his hands are giant. He wears size 17 shoes. Like, he's built in a factory. And, like, if you're the Cleveland Guardians, if he doesn't work out as a hitter, guess what? You still got him on the mound. Like, you don't have to make him a two-way guy immediately. But you have that in your back pocket. The only way I don't see Cags going number one overall is if he's asking for the ten million or whatever they have in the signing bon or the bonus pool, and Cleveland doesn't want to pay it. Like if Cleveland wants to take a a, a budget cut, like a I don't know a Bazana or Nick Kurtz or whoever wants to take less money, like that would be um, the only excuse. But I got Cags going one uh, to Cleveland. I think Charlie Condon fits perfectly in Cincinnati. Um, power to all fields, small ballpark. Uh, he can play multiple positions for you. I have the Rockies taking Hagen Smith number three. I think if you're the Rockies, you don't get free agent signings um, on the map. Pitchers do not want their careers to end in Colorado. But you go draft a guy that's, in my opinion, the best, most polished college pitcher um, in Hagen Smith, send him out to Colorado. Maybe you get a 10 year career out of him. Uh, I think Braden Montgomery fits the Oakland A's perfectly. Like he is the like tools wise, like he's up there with Cags, and he's up there with I mean like he, he, power, speed, arm strength, uh, just electric factor. He gets on base, switch hitter. I think Oakland all the way. Um, Bazana to the White Sox. Wait, okay, why Bazana to the White Sox? They already tried the Nick Madrigal experience, and that failed. You can't compare Nick Madrigal to Travis Bazana. I'm just saying, Oregon State, middle infielder, White Sox. Yeah. 
I just think he'll be the best available. The White Sox will take best available at five. I mean, if Bazana goes earlier than that, then they won't. Um, I, I could see Chase Burns going to the White Sox, to be honest, right there. Like, let's go get the next best college arm or equal. Like, I think Hagen Smith and Chase Burns are pr- pretty much equal as far as, like, one throws right hand and one throws left-handed. Who do you want? But, yeah, I got Bazana sh- showing up there with the White Sox. I don't know. I think he's a good fit. Um Kurtz, Burns. The first high school guy I have going is Cam Caminetti uh, to the Angels. I think the Angels are going to – they've been drafting college guys in the first round recently and, uh, like, promoting them to the big leagues quickly, but their farm system is terrible. And I think Caminetti is, like, one of three high school guys in the whole draft that I think will end up being big leaguers. I'm not big on the high school draft class this year. Hey, um, ben, I think it's pretty down. Question. Do you want to go all the way through this, or do you just want to do like top ten and then come back to it once you finalize it? Yeah, no, I'm, just, I'm gonna finish up the top ten. Mm-hmm. I really, I can finish up at nine. Like, I feel good about the Pirates taking Seaver King at nine. Um, like, he's gonna be a guy that's like a true wild card in this draft. I have him his player comp as Mookie Betts, but he's a guy that's played three different infield positions this year, two different outfield positions. Um, and like just electric. I mean, he's one of Jack's favorite players in the country. So if, if, if he's round at nine, I think the pirates take him just based off of what they've taken previously. Um, Tamar Johnson, they took in like number two or three overall a couple of years ago. If they compare that with Seaver King, you got Cabrian Hayes, like you're starting to form like a pretty good utility infield. So, um, anyways, I'll scroll through the rest. If you guys are watching on YouTube, just so you can see, but, um, I, Probably like two of my hot takes. I have Durangelo Sanja going first round. I, I don't think anybody's projecting him to go to first round, but I think 37 through 39, I think he might get scooped up. Um, Blake Burke, I'm an Astros fan. I took, I want the Astros to take Blake Burke so they can start him at first base July 5th. Like <laughs> draft him July 4th or whatever the draft day is. Sign him, put him in the starting lineup immediately. I'm just so tired of the Astros first basements. Jonathan Singleton, Jose Abreu are two of the worst hitters in major leagues. Like, let's get Blake Burke up there, see what he can do with a wood bat. So that is uh, – you can see the rest of my mock draft here. J.J. Weatherhold, I think, slides a little bit. Brody Brecht, I think, slides a little bit. But other than that, I'll come out with a full uh, MLB mock draft before the end of the season. I, I love doing it, though. Man, I love looking at videos. I love looking at stats. I was nerding out last night. Love it. You guys want to talk midweek and kind of wrap this thing up? Yeah, let's talk midweeks and wrap it up. Um, Oh, we got to do our series pick them. People love listening to us debate. Oh, I already picked our weekend series for this next week. It's awesome. You got to give the people what they want, though. They love they love hearing a bitch at each other. All right, let's do it. Share your screen. Go to Warren Nolan. Let's look. Let's preview midweeks and then we do our six weekend series pick them. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm pretty confident. I, I know. I know the six that I want. All right, go to schedule for Tuesday. Oh, yeah. Hey, while you're looking up, can I give my one free shout-out and a shout-out? Yep. I'm going to plug this guy all year. He's a first-rounder. They won't do it because they're all a bunch of frauds. Lyle Miller-Green went six for six at Austin P yesterday. Six yeah. for six. Draft that guy. All right. Anyway, uh, midweek schedule time. Congrats to Lyle Miller Green. Thank you. All right. Hey, wait, wait, time out. Wait, pause, pause the screen right there. No, go back, go back up. Nope, go back up. Very top, right there. First game. What does that say? 12 p.m. Eastern, Ole Miss hosting North Alabama. Only oh. the real 11.7 fans know why that game is so important. Massive. Throw it back, throw it back to 2019. I'm I'm almost positive it's this game, but uh, Ole Miss always does like an elementary school day where every elementary school student from uh, Oxford to Tupelo to anywhere within the area comes to this game, right? Well, in 2019, Ole Miss was on a fringe top 25 team. That was back when we were doing like a legitimate top 25. And they have thousands of Oxford area elementary school kids for this day game. They bus them in, bus load, bus load, but. Ole Miss loses the game to first year Division One North Alabama, and we banned them from the we banned them from the top twenty five the rest of the season. We're like, you do not lose this game in front of children, and expect to be in the top twenty five. 
it was a big hit. People thought it was funny. Even Ole Miss fans thought it was funny. No, uh, no, no, no. They hated us for it. They hated it at first, but then they realized it was a bit, uh, and our top 25 didn't matter. But, yeah, that was like expulsion. Like, grounds for expulsion. Ole Miss, do not lose this game in North Alabama. We will ban you from every – we'll ban you from the uh, – uh, Twitter account. Yeah, we'll block your Twitter account if you lose this. <laughs> Anyways, I just had to throw that, that nugget out there. All right, anyway. Oh, dude, breaking news, breaking news. The Bowling Green Falcons have lost their first mid-American game. With the yeah, that's not breaking news. They did that on throw, Sunday. They blew the lead. I was going to say. <laughs> that's not really breaking news. They started 17-0. and They blew a lead on Sunday. It is what it is. Congrats to the uh, Bowling Green Falcons. All right. Well, I'm just saying, I didn't see that yesterday. <laughs> I don't see any upsets so far. Georgia Clemson. Clemson at Georgia will be fun. A lot of offense. Take the over in that game. Absolutely. Those two teams Absolutely. feast on mediocre pitching and just take the over. Don't think, just bet. North Carolina, Duke, East Carolina. Yeah, North Carolina, East Carolina is going to be a good one. The, hey. One of those teams I feel like has won like, like the last seven meetings there. I don't remember which one. Maybe it's East Carolina's beaten NC State like the last seven or maybe vice versa. No. Um, NC State already won the first one between them this year, right? Maybe that's what it was. I don't know. There's like some history between those two teams where like one yeah. of those teams oh, dominates. No, no. East Carolina smoked them. That's right. Yeah. East Carolina. They went two, yeah, they went two straight. But this is a big one because this is the Makarevich bowl game, dude. Like they, the jungle's been crapping on the boy a little bit. He's about to go back uh, and hit like six homers in that game. Yeah, hey, take the Alec Makarevich home run player props. Take all – invest all of his player props. All of them. Ben, I just want to be the – I want to say something here. All the people that were coming on Twitter cl clowning us for having Campbell rank too low, we were right. We knew. We should have stuck to our guns all year. They got lucky against Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara gave them that series, and Georgia Southern ended up being a decent series win. Campbell is who we thought they were. They had us in the first half, not going to lie, but they are who we thought they were. Yeah, they've lost, I think, three CAA series already. Like, they've lost to Delaware. They've lost to Hofstra. Like, it's just not a good not a good scene right now for lost Campbell. Lost to Delaware. Lost but this feels like a game books. that they win, right? Like, this feels uh -huh. like a game at home, midweek. Duke's, like, in the middle of, like, a grind of an ACC schedule. Like, it feels like a game Campbell's going to win. <laughs> Campbell's we already know Stetson's going to beat the shit out of Florida. Like, that's a fact. <laughs> Just, Hatter's money line. Put I it think the yeah. might be favorites there. Look, the Stetson's going to be minus 150, dude. Yeah. Hey, North Florida money line, question mark? No. No. Florida State plays well in the midweeks. I'll tell you this. I can't remember the last time Mercer beat Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern owns Mercer, like, since I was playing. I think I went 0-4 against Georgia Southern in my career. That's unfortunate. They just beat Mercer every single time. Kenneth thought Georgia Tech beat in a little, uh, little game. Ooh, man. This is a game. This is important for both teams. Yeah. Western Kentucky, we have in uh, winning this Conference USA in our field of 64 at Louisville. Louisville struggles in the midweeks. They give up a ton of runs. Their pitching's not deep. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be watching that one. I'll tell you this. Maryland at James Madison. Like, James Madison's 23rd That's in the cool. RPI. And they're at home against, you know, a pretty solid RPI Maryland team. Like, if they can sneak a win there, that'd be big. I see a um, Liberty State. always beats – Liberty always beats ACC teams in the midweek. So Not anymore. They just did that that one year. I feel like it was like two You're or three You're the good years. one. Stanford out of Alabama. Stanford money line question mark? Stanford beat Alabama recently, right? Well, Who'd they beat in the midweek? They beat Auburn. They beat Auburn. No, I think they lost to Auburn because I I bet on them. They beat somebody big. Oh, Kentucky. They beat Kentucky midweek. Coastal. How about Coastal going to Omaha? Coastal is going to Omaha this year, boys. Charles that Schwab is a Field. fact. They're, they're playing in Charles Schwab Field this year. They are going to Omaha. Dang, that joke kind of just flew over my head for a hard Yeah, they're playing at Creighton. Ball. Tuesday, Wednesday matchup. I think I think they play twice. Yo, remember when people clowned us for not having Oral Roberts in our mid-major preseason top twenty-five? Yeah, they're trash. Eleven games under five hundred. 
Dallas Baptist TCU is a big one. Rebound for both teams. Seven, no, that's about it. Um, Southern Miss two lanes, fun to watch. I always like two lanes broadcast. They're good. You're going so fast. Chill out. Scroll back up. Dude, I promise you, you're not missing anything. Well, Kansas at Nebraska is always fun. Look, Kansas is nine and nine in the Big Twelve. That could play a big role. They, yep, yeah, that, they can, that midweek they, matters. They're not out yet. They're not out of it yet. Ooh, Northridge Fresno. Just shut up. Fresno just got I swept by up. San Jose State. Get out of here. I know, just, I know. We kicked them out of our mid major. Two West Coast uh, upsets. Portland will beat the Beavers. Port, the Beavs, Beavs are going munch in. Portland we beats them. Portland out too. No, we didn't. Didn't no, we? we didn't. no, we didn't. No, the Portland's in our mid major. Yeah. Don't scare me like that. Uh, UC Irvine always beats UCLA, so that's a win. Yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, oh, go to Wednesday. There's got to be better midweek. This mid, oh god, dude, this midweek kind of sucks. Nothing. West Virginia Penn State will be fun to watch. Um, I think it's a dollar hot dog night, free entry. It'll be packed pretty relatively close to each other. God, Mercer's losing another midweek. To, they're going to lose two midweeks to Georgia Southern. Golly. Well, guys, this. Yeah, midweek, this, these midweeks are kind of kind of tough, man. <laughs> so here, I want to Not stage clear. a question for the boys. It's going to be a little bit of a commit right. for Riz. All right. But... Let's, get the pick em, let's get the pick them done. Wait, you just interrupted Jack. What did you say? All over it. Riz got the long commit. Ben, Club Bromaha Tuesday night, or do we make a little drive up to the jungle? Thoughts? I think you got to get to Club Bromaha. Dude, the jungle's kind of far. It's like five and a half for me. Is it really? Yeah, for me. Nice. I've looked it up before. So then Club Romaha. Club I'll Romaha, do Club Romaha, Romaha there's, Tuesday. There's, there's two or three good games you guys can key in on. Yeah. State and, and yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk a little Omaha. We'll talk a little State in the Jungle. And then um, we, we can watch Portland upset the Beavs. Yeah. Club Romaha Tuesday. We need to bring it back. It's been about four weeks. So. I'm in. Let's do it. It's time Thursday, to nothing really. I mean, Ole Miss, Alabama, I guess. Those kind of suck too. All right, here we go. Right, can, I, can I tell you the five series that I know that I really, really nope, want? We're going to do it here. Pretend that didn't happen. Why? Why are we pretending? <laughs> people want to hear. We're, we're as authentic as it comes. Look, I want Army it. Navy. Army Navy, first overall draft pick. Oh my God. Army Navy is in. First overall Support draft it. pick, Army Navy. Support the troops, both sides. Last year, you did a cool little graphic on the pick em. You did like American flag or something. Oh, I it sure did. Out. I'll bring it back. Yeah. Um, second overall pick. Can I have it for the for the pod? Moorhead State at SEMO. Big inner inner pocket rivalry. Wait, wait, hold on. Hold on. Well, let me see what the OVC standings look like. Um, I don't think it matters. I think this is just a podcast. This is a podcast war. Okay. Me and Jack are Team Moorhead. War. You're and Team SEMO. Speaking of podcast war. I got my Moorhead shirt right over there. I'll go throw it on. All right. Oh, dude. Oh, dude. What are we getting hyped over? What are we getting hyped over? What? They're not even. They're, they're still a game or two. Oh, you know what? They're still in it. They're still in it. Who cares? It's about the pod. It's about the brand. I don't care if they're 0 30. Yeah, this is a this is a pod debate. We've talked about this for six weeks now. All right, what is it? Morehead at SEMO? Yeah, Morehead yep. at SEMO. Hey, SEMO Morehead. SEMO Head. SEMO Head. SEMO Head. All right, no more whispering. That's, you're getting weird That's with just... it. You're getting creepy. How many? Uh, hey, how I'm many... going to throw another one out there. Can I throw out uh, Texas at Oklahoma? Nope, don't like it. Why? Okay. Can I throw out Oregon at Oregon State? I like that. Okay. Uh, this is a must-have. Florida State at Duke. Got to have it. Dude, we're doing Florida State again. Yeah, at Florida State at Duke. Come on. <sighs> Premier <laughs> ACC matchup. And, hey, if you, if you think, hey, we're doing Florida State again, uh, Southern Miss plays at Louisiana Lafayette. We've done those teams about eight times each, but big series. 
and if you want to do it again, <laughs> Troy's playing at Coastal. <laughs> We've done those teams oh, about 10 times. No, 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 no. We are not doing that one. We are not I'm doing on, that one. I am so tired I'm on the, of Coastal and Troy. I'm on the call for that one. So we've oh, definitely yeah. that one. A little college game. Well, day. Then you, won't, you wouldn't be able to pick it. You wouldn't be able to no, pick we'll that series. So we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll veto it. it. But if you are in the Carolinas, come and see the boys. We're doing a broadcast from the beach or uh, from the boardwalk. Hey, what about what about Cincinnati at UCF? Former American Athletic team finally facing off in the Big Twelve. Nope. Nope. That's just veto. Yeah, that's you, dude, you veto Texas at Oklahoma. And you Red want River. Cincinnati at UCF? I mean, I was kind of joking, guys. I don't actually. Um, I, you love the Big East one that I really like. St. John's at Xavier? Nope. Stinky oh, poo. No, stinky, pinky. Stinky, pinky poo poo. <laughs> Poopy stinks would pick that series. Uh, what about Paul at Charleston and Campbell? Nope. Okay. That's a great series. What about Incarnate Word at Lamar? <laughs> nope. All right. Lamar just lost two out of three to AM Corpus Christi. Um, Kentucky we... at South Carolina? Nope. That's a huge Wait, what? one. I think we should find two horse shit teams. Two of the most horse shit teams in the country. <laughs> uh, Iowa and Nebraska is a pretty cool one. I was playing a little bit better. Wow. Gonzaga really woke up and decided to play ball in the West Coast Conference. Yeah. Eight and 17 out of conference. Um, Lafayette at Bucknell. I got them to win it all at Bucknell. Why are we doing that one? Oh, it's just too bad team. Uh Oh. Why is why yeah, why why the two bad ones? Let's do some fun storylines. Let's get some fans that are heated. Let's see if let's see if Maryland Eastern Shore can get their first win. Who are they playing? Wagner. Oh god, Wagner's gonna smoke him. Oh my yeah. god, smoke him. Dude, all right. Great fun investment. Hey, we have five. We have five. We need one more. All right, I'm done playing games. Who do you guys want? How many, who do you want? How many how many who do we have? How many series do we have? Army, Navy, more, more has SEMA, Oregon, Oregon State, Florida State, Duke, Southern Miss, Louisiana. I, dude, I can't. How many is that? I, you went too fast. That's five. That's five. Um, I mean, Texas, Oklahoma, or Kentucky, South Carolina. You pick. It's got to be one of those two. Jack pick. Oh, dude, I'm the Red River ride or die, but that's just me. But we did just did two Texas, didn't we? So. All right. Texas, Oklahoma. Welcome. I don't know. I kind of like Kentucky at South Carolina. No? I like that one too. South Carolina at home, Kentucky. Going to have to prove it on the road. I mean, I can make a case for both of those teams winning. I think Kentucky's a better I, team, but be South Carolina's you, at home. To be honest with you, I'm not confident that Texas can win that series at Oklahoma. What will be more split between fan bases? Because you're right. I think it means that weekend means more to South Carolina. If they want to host a regional and they win against Kentucky, then all and of I a think sudden, the place is going to be popping. I think Founders yeah. Park will be cool. is rocking. Back to back weekends with top five teams. Do South Carolina. Ben, what do you think? You don't seem too enthused by that. No, it's not that. Like, I kind of want both of them now. <laughs> they kick out who's Utah Valley two. playing? Wait, who's Utah Valley playing? <laughs> no, you know what? Screw that. Texas, Oklahoma, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing Texas series again after the TCU one. Kentucky, right, so, yeah, South Carolina, done. Case closed. The books have been closed. No more changes. Can I make I like one more request? Uh, St. John's at Xavier? No, we already have six. Okay, that's fair. It's big. It's a huge Big East battle. Big East is getting two teams in. I'm anti Big East. I am very high in Prasco Park, though. Yeah. Jack, when we get off, when we log off here, go look up Prasco Park on Google. Prasco. Sounds neat. Also, you guys. Ben, is that all we have on the to do list? Yeah, that's all we got for this episode. Jack, what were you saying? 
I was trying to get Dimitri to count. You guys disregarded me. I almost got him to do it. Oh. I got him to read off the names, but you just totally – Yeah, I thought you were on the same page with me. The viewers at home were on the board. I said how many? I'm, like four times. I'm never on the same page. I'm on my did, own page did. always. He did, he did count, though, pre-show. When we were doing the field of 64, he counted how many uh, – how many spots were left? It was like one, two, yeah. three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, eight looked. spots left. Hey, that's two in a row. One more. We call it a winning streak, baby. We call it a winning streak, boys. Wait, no how many? Hashtag what? 2024, no counting. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. Did he just do it? Did he just go one, two in a row? Did he just does that? I think he said one, count? two, three is a winning streak. <laughs> I said one, two, and three of the winning streak. That's not counting. Count it to three. That's no, that's, no, that's not that's not counting. ABC that one two three. Counting. All right, we need Sorry to get off. Um, appreciate yeah. everybody listening. Um, we'll be back Club Romaha tomorrow, Tuesday night. That'll be fun, and uh, record a pod Wednesday, maybe Thursday morning, just whenever schedules align. But right. any, anyways, we're getting close, guys. Month left before conference tournament. So, um, subscribe to our YouTube. I'm just gonna say it. Like and subscribe. To the end of the damn show. Like and subscribe.